Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. It's where we're headed today. Beginning with verse 1, Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Meanwhile, when the crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed and, uh, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roof. I tell you, friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that do no more, but I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who have, after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows more... Uh, sold for two pennies, yet none of them is forgiven by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered, and don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word continues to help us in everyday life. Lord, even when life can get challenging and difficult, we thank you that we can trust you. And Lord, we ask this morning that the Holy Spirit will continue to show us what we need to grow in, what we need to become, what you want to make us and mold us into so that we can become all that you have in mind. And Lord, this morning I ask that the Holy Spirit will take the Word of God and bring it to life. It'll be alive to those who hear and see and Lord, I thank you that you're going to help me convey what you've spoke to my heart. And Lord, I need your help because I know I cannot do this on my own. And so Lord, thank you for what you're going to do this morning. Thank you for how you're going to help us and help us to see what you see today. And Lord, bless our time together in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, if you've ever been going anywhere in life, you see these yellow flashing lights, or maybe you've seen the red and blue behind your car uh, that cause you to slow down or rearrange what you've been doing, and they, they actually are standing in the way of where you're going, but they're not to stop you many times or to kind of slow you down and deter you or, or cause you to be recognizing of some things. They're called warning signs. All the time, that the day that we traveled yesterday going to Minot, there was signs along the road that told us what speed we're supposed to be traveling, what, what, uh, what lane we're supposed to be in, and all these things. And even in road traffic, they had specific signs that if you speed here, you're going to get an $80 ticket. You know, I mean, they give you fair warning, don't they? Well, there's warnings in Scripture that you and I need to heed, but there's also encouragements, and that's in the next couple weeks, we're going to target them. But uh, this morning I want to talk about the, the beginning part of, of Luke chapter 12. And I'd like to gather with me uh, verse, verse 1 again. It says, Be on the guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. That's a warning. And I want us to realize that that's not a warning to the world. That's a warning to Christians. Because the world doesn't care if they're hypocrisy or not. They're not concerned about what, 
when they stand before God. But you and I as believers need to be aware of this, that this is a warning. Why is it a warning? Because it happens probably way too much. Where we begin to say one thing and do another. We begin to, to, to uh, confess and begin to walk with our life, and then we begin to change gears and walk the opposite direction of what we confessed and what we committed to. And I believe that is partially what we see here is that the Pharisees were good at hypocrisy. And I want to encourage you and myself this morning that we are to be on our guard against hypocrisy. Let's turn just back a page to Luke 11, chapter 11, verse 37. And it begins to describe the things that we need to be aware of. In Luke chapter 11, it talks about the hypocrisy. And that is the yeast of the Pharisees. And there was one description that I found that it comes, the yeast is the interpretation and teachings of men, not of God. That the hypocrisy and the yeast is the interpretation and the teaching of men, not of God. It's interesting to see how we can take the same word that we've all read out of the Bible and begin to use it for something wrong. Begin to use it for something that is not godly. But it looks good. It sounds good. And it might even, you might even find yourself getting involved in something like that. Let me just tell you right now, there's things, that, and ever since Jesus was on the earth, there's things that he's always had to address about warning signs about going off the right path into the wrong road. That leads you to the very thing God's not interested in, into deception, into things that would definitely cause God to once again not be on your side. Because you can't disobey God and expect Him to bless you. You can't go and do the wrong thing and think God's going to bless you. You and I have to walk this consistent road that we go on, and when we do make a mistake or we do begin to go off the road, that's where repentance is so powerful that brings us back to the road that we were on to begin with. If you've ever been driving down the road in a new place you've never been to before and find yourself on the wrong road, you have this wonder little thing on your phone that tells you how to get back on it. It's called GPS. Or you have this thing that causes you to get back where you and I need to be so we can get to the destination we're going. How many of you know you can't live for the devil and get to heaven? You can't live for your flesh and get to heaven. It doesn't work. And so the reality is, is that the reason we're all here this morning is to make sure that we don't fall into the traps of the hypocrisy, the yeast of the Pharisees, the teachings of men that would lead us down a path that would lead us away from God rather than to Him. Amen. And it's warning signs all the way through Scripture. Almost every church that Paul wrote to had warning signs. They were warning them not to go down this road. Don't stay true to Jesus Christ. And the same warning signs are still today. You can follow yourself. You can follow anything other than Jesus and think that you're on the right road. But God's word always shows us and reveals to us that isn't the, but doesn't the Bible say he is the light? He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he's the one that we have to stick true to. So if you find yourself getting away from this book and beginning to read too many other books, that can happen very quickly. Does that mean that writers are wrong? I didn't say that. What I am saying is, is that if other books than the scriptures become more important to you you may find yourself on a road that is not godly somewhere along the way. And so my heart's desire is that I grow in love with this book more and more every day. Some days I don't grow as much as I'd like to. Some days I'd love to wish I was, I was a little bit further, a little bit more understanding of this book. But you know what? 
Today's a brand new day. What I have done, I can't go back and change. But where I'm going, I can take this book and begin to read it more than I ever have and watch the Holy Spirit come and begin to lift the words and the understanding off the pages into my heart and my mind so that I can begin to run and walk and do exactly what God wants to do in this day, in this hour, and in this time. But there's reasons why we don't want to be like the Pharisees. And it's interesting that God brings this passage of Scripture into our understanding so that we can know what that means. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. So let's jump over to Luke chapter 11 and let's begin looking at verse 37. There's six woes that we see in this passage and it's all about the Pharisees. And he said, verse 37, when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table, but the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. And then the Lord said, now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. So if you ever find yourself coming to church or find yourself doing good things, thinking you're okay and going home and leaving church and doing whatever you want, finding yourself going places you probably shouldn't go or buying things you shouldn't buy or whatever the case might be, you might find yourself being pharisaical or being like a Pharisee. And we all have to grow. None of us come to Jesus fully packaged. We come to Jesus like a baby, and we are to grow up into being like Christ. And that's going to take us the rest of our life. If you and I ever quit growing, we're in trouble. We can begin to be stunted, we can begin to go backwards, or we can begin to be drawn to things that God didn't have us wanting to be drawn to. Why? Because we quit growing. Have you ever noticed if you go on a diet... You ever wonder, am I going to be able to eat this kind of food the rest of my life? That's what I think of when I think of a diet. And it's, before I ever start, it's like, nope. So I don't even start. <laughs> There's just no way I'm going to be able to eat like this the rest of my life. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't make small changes. And maybe my taste buds will begin to like things that... Uh, I don't like now. <laughs> but the reality is, is that God wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. But as we grow and mature, it's easy for us sometimes to be so caught up in something that God isn't doing that we begin to be drawn to things that the devil's doing. How many people do you think in Scripture God wrote to and said, don't be deceived? How about from the very beginning? Adam and Eve, uh, this, is just, this, this has become more of a reality to me lately than ever. Adam and Eve were in a perfect world, and they still got deceived. Deception runs rampant today. So you and I have to have our eyes opened, our ears tuned to what? What the world is saying? No. We have to have our eyes tuned and we have to have ourselves trained and responsive to this, to the Word of God, so that this begins to become something of so much a part of us that we are the ones that won't be deceived. We are the ones that won't be led astray. We are the ones that won't step on those roads that God says, this is a dead end, Jeff. Don't even go here. Get off this road. Stop right now. Turn around and get back on the right path. Because you know as well as I do, it's easy sometimes for us to get tired of what God isn't doing. And we begin to search somewhere where God is trying to do something, but it's really not God. It's really just an, actually out appealing to our flesh. And many times those things can lead us astray. So what God wants us to do is to consistently stay true to the Word of God. So we want to be on the guard of against the yeast of the Pharisees. And he says, like he says here, when he was talking to the Pharisee, he said, you didn't wash your hands. Well, you want to know why that was a big deal to the Pharisees? 
I just learned this. The Pharisees believed that if you had anything to do with idols while you were washing them and making food, or while you didn't wash them and you were making food, if you didn't wash your hands, you could have been involved in something demonic that when you eat the food, you could ingest the demonic. That's why washing hands was such a big deal. And religiously, that was the way it was. So they began to think that Jesus, we don't know where he's been. We don't know what he's doing. And he's, he's touching this food. and He could easily be ingested by this, this demonic. But Jesus was greater than that. Just like Jesus will always be greater than anything you and I ever face. Never forget that. Do you ever notice that Jesus wasn't concerned about the, the, the leprosy colony? Do you ever notice that Jesus wasn't concerned about different things? Why? Because the very life of Jesus was in him. And when he went, he was the one that in, changed the atmosphere of where he was going. And that is the same way for us as believers. When we step into realms and, and places that we've, we've been to many times or whatever, we should literally begin to change the atmosphere of where we're going. Why? Because the life of Jesus lives in us. The healing power of Jesus is in you. The, the prophetic, the, the, the tongue and interpretation, all the gifts of the Spirit should be in you. Because it can learn to function and begin to flow like God wants it to because that's how God builds and establishes the church. He uses the giftings. He uses the, the ministries, the, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, all of that to do His work. So in order for the Pharisees to get rid of this demonic thing, you had to go through a whole bunch of ceremonial washings to get rid of whatever it is you didn't wash your hands for. And so they were really upset with Jesus that he didn't wash his hands. But isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't stop right there? He said this to them. He says, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. If you have a dishwasher at home, you've probably somewhere along the way put a dish in there, thinking after it was clean, you pulled it out and was ready to use it. And you open and turn it over and it's like, Oh, look what I found. Or maybe you had somebody wash dishes in your house, and they might not have got it all off. So as soon as you pull it out, it's like, uh-oh, this is still dirty. Well, how many of you still use it? Yeah, I got faces going, <laughs> Right? No, you stick that back in the wash. Why? Because it's still dirty. Well, guess what? God wants... Not only the, for the Pharisees, he wants for us to be so clean on the outside as well as the inside. And how is God going to clean us up on the inside? The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Those two are the cleaning agents that begin to work in me, that begin to work in different areas of my life, at different ages of my life. No matter how long I've been a Christian, God will continue to work in me and begin to work things out as we grow because all of a sudden, as we grow and we get grown up in the Lord, there's things that God wants to use, but there's little things that stand in the way of my past. Could be a thought. Could be a belief system. It could be something that we agree to that we should have never agreed to. It could be something that's standing in the way. And that's when the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will begin to cleanse and wash me. Isn't it interesting that husbands should clean their wives with the washing of the water of the Word? What does that mean? That means that we have the power and the potential as the husbands of the, just like Jesus is our husband, we have the power and potential to speak life or death into our spouse. We have ability to help them or hinder them. And sometimes it's so easy to hinder them, we don't care. Let's just be honest. Sometimes it's so easy to step on the, the wrong road just because my feelings are in charge today. And I don't want to submit to the Holy Spirit. That's really what we're saying. Especially if we know better. If I know better, it's nothing but flat-out rebellion. So I get to decide of whether I want to be an agent of encouragement or an agent of discouragement. 
One that would come and begin to say things that would not be beneficial to my wife and vice versa. So we want to make sure that God is able to work not only on the outside, but the inside. The behavior that people see, yes, he's going to change that. But he's also going to change those things inside of us of what we've believed and what we've agreed to so that we can begin to walk in agreement with what God wants as a disciple, as one trained. Notice, once again, he's writing to his disciples about the Pharisees, about the yeast of the Pharisees, how it's going to affect them. So what does the church need to be aware of? The very same things, because if you don't watch it, it can creep in and begin to ruin everything God wants to do. I can't tell you how many uh, times that in the, well, ever since I began to go to church with or more meetings with my mom and dad when I was young, of watching people in ministry begin to start well but not finish well. Why is that? Because what was on the inside wasn't cleaned as much as what looked like on the outside. And so all of us need to work on this. All of us need to keep this in check where we make sure that we don't fall into that trap. The next thing that he tells us to be warned of is verse 39. He says, The Lord said, now then you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. I don't know about you, but I've never really understood this as much as I probably have today as I'm going to share it with you. Here's the thing. Remember who he's writing to when he says this. He's writing to his disciples, correct? So as a disciple, what happens to us? We begin to clean the inside as much as the outside. A Pharisee, we only clean the outside. So if the Pharisees offered what was in the dish, the little bit that was in the dish, the alms or what was left over, that wouldn't be very good, would it? But as a disciple, what has God begun to do in me? He's begun to clean me. He's begun to wash me. He's actually began to give me things in my dish that I can offer to you. 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 I have things that God's put in me that I didn't have naturally that God wants to put in me. So now he says, whatever little you have left in your dish, give it to the poor. Don't hold it back. Don't think it's of no value. Begin to offer it to those around you as alms or as, as, a, as a tithe. So then he says, because if, as a believer, it's a clean work. It's a work of the Spirit. It's not the work of the Pharisees, which Jesus was absolutely, totally against. So the little bit that was left in there, he said, I want you to, I want you, as a believer, as a disciple, I want you to give that away. But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be made, will be clean for you. Because God would never ask us to give our sin to the poor, would he? He would always ask us. So he's not talking about the Pharisees right now. He's talking about the disciples. Offer what I've put in you, even if it's a little bit. Just offer a little bit of what's put in you. Isn't that interesting? That if you do that, You'll, you'll see that what God wants to do is, is clean. Let's keep going. So then verse 42, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint and rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So in other words, he says, I want you to give a tenth of your, your goods. I want you to give a tenth, which is what we would call tithing. But I want to encourage you when it comes to tithing, don't just give whatever a tenth. Maybe God wants you to give more. Maybe he'll ask you to give more because isn't it God's anyway? When I become a disciple, don't, doesn't, help Gladys, Gladys, Gladys has been so good to help me over my, over my lifetime of being able to speak a little bit better. <laughs> she corrects me all the time, and I love it because I need all the help I can get. <laughs> but it, but as, we, as we give of a tenth, 
That's a good start, but what else does God want to do? What other things is God in mind wanting to do as he has in mind for us with our finances and with our, our time and everything that we have? We give God a tenth, but he also wants us to give us of our goods. And that's what the rue is. That's what he was saying. Give a tenth of both your, your, your money and your goods. But he says, that, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter. So justice, doing what is right, doing what's right in God's eyes, hearing and understanding what God wants to do. Because God doesn't want you to go into, let me just say this, God isn't interested in social justice. God is interested in you and I learning how he serves people. And if you learn to serve God's people the way he does, you won't have to worry about social justice. But social justice will never get you to God. Because anybody can do social justice. The man walking down the street with a million dollars can give half of it away and not be hurt by hardly anything. Does that please God? No. Because he wouldn't have told these guys the very same story if, if that was going to be okay. He wouldn't have said the Pharisees did the right thing by doing what they did if it wasn't right. But he said, no, this is not what you do. You learn to give out of love and out of whatever God has brought into you. Why? Because if you give what God's told you to give, you're going in obedience to what God's has. And he said, you should practice this. This is something that you should do. So everywhere you go, learn to hear God's saying. Not only with your finances, your time, your talents, your gifting, whatever it is, learn to be like Jesus. But don't rewrite what Jesus did. Don't learn to think that this is the way Jesus did it, so that's what I'm going to do. No, learn to walk in the realm of what the Word says Jesus did and do that. Stay away from all the things that the world is doing. Because here's the deal. If we wanted to reach the world, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing here today. How many unsaved people are sitting in here today? Why not? Why not? Because they don't care what God thinks. What are you? You should be a disciple, one that's trained to hear, know, and understand God. That when God speaks, you're ready to move. So actually, I anticipate people leaving our service because God told them to go do something. Even during our time of worship, during our time of worship, that's okay with me. Why is that okay with me? Because you're hearing God. Yes, it's good to get together, but I believe there might be one or two or three times in a year where God will say, I need you over here now. And I expect you to obey. I anticipate your obedience. I enjoy watching people being obe obe obeying God in what he's asking them to do. Why is that? Because obedience to God is one of the greatest forms of worship. If, if disobedience to God is okay, then leave your kids alone when they disobey you. As an employer, forget about who doesn't pay their bill. Who cares? No, but we do care, don't we? We do want our kids to grow up and understand what's right and what's wrong. What God has created them to be. Rather than the world, what the world is trying to teach them right now. So these Pharisee things are really important for us. Learn to give and learn to do things the way God wants it done and continue to practice them. Then he says in verse 43, Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces. Look at them. They're full. No, not really. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the Pharisees wanted to be so noticed that what they did, that they make a special announcement. One of the reasons I'll never probably tell you I'm a pastor you don't need to know that I'm a pastor. You just need to know I'm Jeff Capel. I just happen to have a different job description. Why is it important for you to know that I'm a pastor? I have no idea. All I find is people start acting funny when they hear that. <laughs> for most of you, I don't have enough pen and paper to keep up with what you're doing. It's not my job. Just be real. When you come here, just be real. Be who you are. Why? 
Because you're not faking it enough to get God's eyes blinded. If God can see it, what do you care about us for? So we have to come to the place where we learn to recognize God is wanting to do something inside of us that it becomes evident in our everyday living. And, and you, know, you know what? No matter what does or doesn't happen in our life, right or wrong, it still doesn't give me the right to do whatever I want. To say, well, that's just the way I am, you know. Not anymore. You gave up that when you got saved. And God's going to begin to take a hammer and chisel and begin to chisel away at that hard stone that you molded in your life. And he's going to begin to reshape you. He's going to begin to redo things in you. Why? Because he loves you enough to watch you be a fulfillment of what he designed in your mother's womb. Can you imagine what it's like for God for one of us to come to heaven? They made it! They're here! <laughs> applause, applause! The angels rejoice when a sinner gets saved and comes into heaven. There's great rejoicing. What is that? They overcame! They won! But how sad it is when they have to watch one go straight to hell. All because they thought they could walk away from God and still be okay. All because they wanted to put their life into their own hands and do whatever it is they wanted to do rather than what God wanted them to do. And I don't know about you, but I definitely want you and I to understand this this morning. It's really, really important that if we're going to come here, claim Christianity, when you and I walk out these doors, it's obvious to those around us who we really are. That means you and I have to watch when we go shopping, when we, go, when we go to town, when we go out to eat, when we, when we uh, go do business, whatever the case might be, we have to watch our whole life. Why is that? Because people are watching you. They know that you go to church. They know that you're doing whatever it is you're doing. And so they're going to anticipate some actions to go with that which goes to church. That's what calls themselves believers. And that's what God was saying about the Pharisees. Don't have a Pharisee syndrome where you say one thing here and do something else out there. That's a Pharisee. Doing whatever it is I want, even though I call myself a believer. God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to step into this role of doing what we believe and allowing ourselves to walk in agreement with God's Word. Didn't Jesus say Himself? You'll obey my commands if you love me. Wow. So when I don't obey his commands, what is that saying to him? What I want to do is way more important than obeying you. And that's not a good sign to send to God. So if you ever find yourself in that position, even if you've made a foolish choice, just turn from it. And say, Lord, forgive me, help me, strengthen me, empower me to help me to walk away from that and keep walking down the right road. God wants to help us. He's not out to get you. He's out to get the devil and his cohorts. He hates them, guys. It's the only time you and I can hate and be okay. You can hate the devil because God hates the devil. But do you hate him enough not to listen to him anymore? Even when your fur rises up inside. Or on the outside, whatever, wherever your fur is. <laughs> Do you hate him enough to walk away from him, even though your emotions are doing whatever they're doing? And let's just be honest. Some days we do okay, but there's some days we wish we could go back and do it over. Can we be honest with ourselves today? We're not, in other words, let's take the mask off when we come to church and just be real. Let's just say, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm, what's going on. I need somebody to pray with me today. I need some help. I need some encouragement. Whatever the case might be, let's walk together and let's walk in victory. It's always fun to watch teammates when they play a game or whatever, they, whatever sport or whatever they're doing, to watch them play together in such a way that they win against the opponent. Well, how many of you know the devil's out to get you every day and God wants you to win against him every single day? One more, and then I'm going to close. We'll pick it up next week and more about the Pharisees, the Pharisee syndrome. 
He says, verse 44, Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing. Unmarked graves are like walking anywhere you want, doing whatever it is you want to do. They were defiling themselves and didn't even care that under Jewish law, you were not even to come close to anything dead. Otherwise, you would be contaminated. So, in other words, to walk anywhere I want, like there's no, mar- there's no place I can't go, is really telling God, I can go wherever I want and I'll still be okay with you, right, God? Not necessarily. Because if I walk anywhere I want, I might be walking on places of death thinking I'm going to be okay. And God says, you can't do that. Even under Jewish law, they couldn't do that. So you and I don't want to get in the place where we want to walk anywhere we want and do whatever we want and then tell God that's where we're going. The Jewish leaders were doing this and they, they weren't caring they went where they wanted to, they did what they did, and the result was is that they were contaminated by sin. And that's why Jesus had such an opposition against them. You and I, once again, have to come to the place where we don't live this life just any way we want. Do you realize that when Jesus went to the cross, they said when they hung him there that he was unrecognizable as a human? Not like the pretty pictures we have on our wall. They said they couldn't even recognize he was human. Do you really think he went through all that so you could go and do whatever you want? Do I really think that I can just go off and think any way I want, talk any way I want, do whatever I want, spend my money any way I want, and just think that God's supposed to be all of a sudden okay? Not necessarily. Why? Because that's not true discipleship. True discipleship comes under surrender. When God says, I, or when we sing this, I surrender all, I mean, when, when, the, when the officer place, places a gun at you, what does he say? Put your hands up where I can see them. Why? Because then you can't do nothing stupid. <laughs> what are you doing? You're saying, I surrender. I give up my rights. I give up my life. Everything about me, I just, everything I've lived up to this point, I surrender. It's not mine anymore, it's yours. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave up all his rights to take my sin If I was the only one that sinned, he would have still died for us, or for me. And he would have went and been tortured because of my sin. And if I really think about that, what gives me the right to think that I can walk out these doors today and say, see you, God, next week. I'm going to go do whatever I want. That shouldn't be our attitude. Our attitude should be say, Lord, lead me, guide me, direct me. I want to go where you go. Why? Because he's full of life. He's full of abundance. He's full of everything I need. He has more than enough. It's greater than anything you and I could ever get. And so I want to come to the place where I learn to surrender, not just once, not just twice, but more than 365 days a year. Every single year, every single day, I learn to surrender. And it should be obvious to you, and it should be obvious to the world that I'm surrendering. I shouldn't have to announce it. I shouldn't have to say this is what God's been doing. Can I testify? Yes. But I don't want to have to go up and say, hey, this is what I've been doing. This is what, this is what, I want to, this is what God wants to do in me. I don't have to advertise. It should be obvious because I'm spending my time a surrendered, crucified walk with him. And that ultimately is what God wants out of me and he wants out of you is a surrendered, crucified walk that says there's nothing of Jeff Capel that's going to talk today. Everything of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's going to put inside the cup, inside the vessel, he's going to put himself in there. And if I learn to pull him out and begin to share him and begin to offer him to people around me, what's going to happen? They're going to recognize what's this strange sight I'm seeing. They call themselves a believer. They call themselves a a Christian. Wow, I I don't think I've ever seen that before. Why? Because Christianity has been misconstrued so bad that we have to go back to the Word of God to get actual true discipleship, actual true 
divine work of the Holy Spirit that we watch and see what God's doing, and then I let that happen in me every single day. I want to encourage you. I don't know where you've been or what's, what's been going on in your life, but this week, start today. Let God have his way today. Let God do in you what he wants to do today. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, do the same thing. If you go to work crabby, go to work happy. Let there be evidence. <laughs> Whatever it might be. It might not be the best place in the world right now, but guess what? If that's where God has you, that's where God wants you to shine. When God's done with you where you are, he'll begin to stir in you where you'll feel unsettled and he'll begin to move you to the next place wherever he has for you, whatever that might look like. Or he might do like he did for Carol and I. We've never left. Some of you are going, oh God. No, I just get it. <laughs> no, but the reality is, is that whatever's in God's plan is what you want to surrender to. So what is God wanting to do in you today? Will you let him? Or are you going to walk out of here and say, I'm going to do it my way? It's up to you. We already know what God's heart is because we've read his word. He wants to put his hands on us. He wants to mold us and shape us into the image of his dear son. That's a guarantee. Every single one of us, he wants to mold us and shape us into the image of what he designed when we were in our mother's womb. And this morning, I have to let him do that. Will you? Let's pray. Father, this morning we want to thank you and praise you that you've got plans and purposes that need to be fulfilled today, but you need us to do them. So Lord, I pray that as we surrender, as we submit to the work that you want to do, I thank you, Lord God, that you're going to continue to do things in us that we could never do ourselves. We can only do with the help of the Holy Spirit and with the tutelage of the Word of God. The Word of God being strong in our life, being relevant in our life, being usable in our everyday life. And so, Lord, I pray today that you'll continue to help us to become more than what we've been before, to, to be able to fulfill the purpose yet ahead. Thank you that nothing's going to be too hard for us because you're going to be there with us. Nothing's going to be too different for us that we can't adjust. Nothing's going to be impossible for us because you're the God of the impossible. Lord, you're so great and you're so powerful, you're so mighty and you're so awesome. And Lord, you want to help us every single moment of every day. We love you, Lord, and we can't wait to learn to walk with you every day. Help us to overcome our weaknesses, overcome our insecurities, overcome our, our, our things that we've established that have become so strong that we literally have to tear them down before you can begin to build. Whatever it might be. And so, Lord, thank you that you want to build us, you want to strengthen us, you want to establish us more than we've ever been. So this morning we ask that you would do that work, beginning today, so that next year when we come back, we're nothing close to what we were when we were here. Because people begin to see that you've been doing a work in us and we've been letting you do it. We love you, Lord, and can't wait to surrender. Lord, it is a joy to surrender to you because we know you've got good plans. Nothing outside of you is anything of benefit for us. Only what's in your hand is what's beneficial to us. So Lord, we come to you to take from you to put inside of us this morning. We ask that you would have your way. We would make room for you to have your way. That we would not be so busy doing our thing that you can't do yours. Lord, thank you for leading and guiding and directing us and helping us every single day. Lord, you're so good. We love you, Lord, and bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, maybe before you leave today, God might want to talk to you specifically. Or maybe as you're driving out of here, God's going to continue to talk, which I believe he does. So whatever it is you feel you need to do this morning, just know this. 
God's got good things in store for you. But you have to agree with His plan, not yours. And I pray that you'll let Him do that, okay? God's blessing to you as you go. As always, the altar is always open. Come on up and spend time with Him. Don't be afraid to have to be in.